Jordan, welcome to the Wire to Wire podcast. I'm glad to have you back on again. It's good to be back, man. Glad to be back. There's a lot to discuss. Coming off from the last episode, uh, we have to get back right back at it, you know? Yeah, so a thanks lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah, a lot. Since we finished that last episode, because we recorded it on a Sunday, mm-hmm. a lot happened within that week and that it's that we got a lot, we got a lot to discuss. Yeah, like before when we started the episode uh, last week, it was just like, it's such a gray area where we don't really know what the next steps will be. And then now we're looking through this week and look how much has happened, right? It was like some things we could have definitely predicted, but we we just knew at the end of the day that eventually everything was going to come out and look at it, right? Because the media is quick to uh, cover content and they have the content right now. Yeah, and it can be it can be really overwhelming with how much the media is constantly putting stuff out. Yeah. Especially the rate of frequency that information is constantly coming in. It can really bombard you. And it's like sometimes you just want to like fall back and be like, whoa, like what is going on? And try to take your own time to process everything, right? Yeah. But um Yeah. Yeah, but to kind of kick off this episode though, I do want to say rest in peace to take off yeah that was a tragic incident that happened after we had recorded that last episode mm-hmm. um, it was just very very unfortunate and yeah. very unpredictable yeah especially knowing you for as long as i've known you i've always actually like i know that meagles was actually one of your favorite like rap groups um and you always used to say that he was the best like he was the most lyrical out of right. it how, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, like, it was crazy because it was the first thing I saw when I woke up in the morning, right? Um, just waking up and then getting ready for work and then checking my phone and then seeing all the TMZs. And sometimes you hope that it's rumors, right? Because um, it almost was quite unbelievable to think that someone that, the me the Migos essentially have been going through so much in recent times, right? They're going through their their split or their unofficial split of offset leaving the group, and then you see them, you see Quavo and Takeoff transition to have their partnership, um, and being Uncle Uncle and Few, right? Being uh, Quavo being the uncle and and Takeoff being the the, the cousin. Uh, in the group, um, it's it's just unfortunate because Takeoff was the one Migo that was always behind the scenes, the quiet one, right? It, it, you'd see Quavo and, and Offset be the ones that were more at the forefront of the group. Um, and then you finally see Takeoff finally find his voice uh, and his personality, and we finally got a chance to understand who Takeoff was, right? Right behind the the music right like i remember watching him on drink champs um and you saw a lot of his personality he was a very funny guy he's a creative guy like he's very knowledgeable as well so at an opportunity at a time when he was really getting the chance to find his footing his voice and almost be a face on his own and not be behind a group um and him to have an to deliver a album with Quavo where he outshine Quavo and he was like the star and and for him to be taken from us it's just it's just unfortunate right because it, it was just at a time where he was finally getting his footing into stardom as not so much an independent but a an individual that you could speak on right you will say take off rather than referencing the Migos and uh, it, it's unfortunate that we're losing such um, prolific people uh, in the hip hop community, uh, and I don't I don't know where or how we can change from here, and or how we can find a way to improve uh, upon this as a community uh, and as a culture in hip hop. Um, but it's just sad to see that it's not just once a year; it, it's happening every few months where we're losing people that are just so prolific and so like well known like now 
Migos are no more. Sad to say, right? But we're a such a prolific group, one of the best rap groups of all time, you could say, right? It's, it's, you you would have never thought it would go out like they break up and then now, a few months later, we're losing Amigo, right? Yeah, that's that's a good perspective. And I think you kind of said something important about the fact that they're all related. Yeah. A lot of times, like, especially like within family, I find like those disagreements are the most contentious. Yeah. Because there's a lot of emotions that are invested into those relationships. And rightfully so, like that's family, right? So mm-hmm. everything they say or do, you're going to take it harder you know than what it actually is and if anyone else was doing it because of how much emotions and love are involved in those relationships right mm-hmm. and you know it just shows that like you know life is really a short thing because yeah it seemed like they didn't really get along that well like there was some tension that was there for whatever reason mm-hmm. so then now it's like the relationship may not have been what it used to be, or it's not, it hasn't, it wasn't as strong as it could have been. And then now for something like that to happen, it's like, it gets left that way. Yeah. Right. So there's no reconciling. There's no Mm -hmm. making things right. If there was any wrongs that were done, it's just that book is closed in a sense. And I think that adds another layer to it. Like you were saying. Yeah. I I just, feel like life is so ironic because maybe I feel like the beef was between Quavo and Offset being two of the alphas in the group and for them to be the ones to cause the breakup whatever the case may be I'm not much sure of the details it's never really been released for them to cause the breakup and then for the one that's not really involved but just following suit and being the one that's just like around and having forced to be pick a side and then it's unfortunate because life is ironic because death has a funny way of bringing people together, right? And for them now to lose, take off, and him to be dead, rest in peace, it's, it's now it's forced Offset and Quavo to come together because they're going to have to come together. They're going to have to talk. They're going to have to get over this situation. They're going to have to put their beef or whatever disagreements they have aside, knowing that they need each other, right? In, the, in, this, in these trying times, right? And it's, it's just going to be, I couldn't imagine how, one, Quavo feeling being one that was there that night um, and knowing like it's something that maybe he could have avoided or who knows, this offset on the other side being one that distanced himself from the group Maybe this whole ordeal doesn't happen if they're a group, right? Maybe offsets that person that like pulls them away from that situation or causes them not to be in that in that predicament, right? Um, so for him to be at a distance and then know that he chose to go independent and almost forget about his family, in a sense, and for that to happen to his family, it's just it's just crazy for that to be to be the reason that a breakup is just it's just a breakup of a music group but now it's a a loss of family member yeah and like there's so much layers and aspects of like what can be taken away so i want to add on to what you said because you see how you said like offset kind of was distancing himself right if you notice offset is married with kids Mm-hmm. just by lifestyle alone he was yeah. going kind of in a different direction right because from my understanding these are two you know single guys so they can have all the fun that they want to have right but with offset he probably just felt as though i'm going just naturally i'm going in a different direction right because now i have a wife i have a kid so i can't be doing a lot of the same things that i used to be doing he's not the same mm-hmm. person Right. So his mindset is more so taking care of them. So just naturally, he wouldn't really find himself in these kind of parties and these events. And I'm not saying it like takeoff was responsible for it. He wasn't. 
Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of more so saying it like your vibe changes, the things that you're interested in doing changes, the spaces you like to be in, all of that changes, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, when you're single and you're young, your homie texts you, yo, you want to head up the club tonight? Without a second thought, you're going to say, yeah, let's go. Yeah. You have a wife and kid there. It's kind of like you're you're going to you're going to second guess it and you're more than likely going to say no because the priorities change. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that was an aspect as well as the fact that, yeah, they have strong personalities. You know, they're both really they were the more recognizable stars within the group from yeah. the mainstream perspective. I think that also caused some clashes. And, you know, sometimes I know a lot of times people get clowned for getting married and like, Mm -hmm. like, but there's honestly a lot of good that comes out of it too, because it does mature you in certain ways. Yeah. Right. But it it, it was very unfortunate. I think another thing that we could learn from this too is like, we lose, like people are losing their lives over frivolous things, particularly people Mm -hmm. in the black community. Right. Like, whether it's over a dice or an argument about basketball, I don't know. I wasn't there. But Mm -hmm. it should never lead to someone losing their life. Mm -hmm. Like, some things are just not worth it. And we have to start recognizing and understanding that certain things are just beneath us. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because in the hip-hop culture, right, and what I think a problem is within the the hip-hop culture is you're forced to take on a character, right? You're forced to act in a manner that matches what you talk about, what you rap about. And you need to be inspired by set setting, right? The strip club, the clubs, going out, multiple women. Like it, it comes with being a, a rapper, being an artist, being involved in hip hop is the environment. Like you can't, it's hard for one to shift their life and settle down, right? And have, live that, that the norms of society um, as a normal human being or a normal man and then try to be a rapper, right? Because then now it's not as believable, right? They see you at the club. They see you like throwing dice. They see you pushing weight or whatever the case may be. It's like, oh, wow, he really, like, he he's really about what he raps about, right? And it's, it's an ego thing, right? You have to fulfill an ego to match the character. Right. And then that is leading to the downfall of a lot of artists in hip hop. Right. And I think the part that like really irritates me about that is the fact that we don't realize how weird of a concept that is until like we reach older in life or something like this happens. And then we realize that it didn't even need to go this way. Mm-hmm. Like when I think about a guy like Jay Z and how he evolved, right? Like if you look yeah. at him, like now he's a family guy. Like, mm-hmm. right? You don't see him at like when you see him at parties, you see him at more like upper echelon parties, right? Yeah. You yeah. don't really see him hanging out at just like your casual club anymore, mm-hmm. right? Now he's about his family and he's about his business, right? And we, yeah. for some reason, take this character thing too far. Mm-hmm. Or like we start to adopt a persona and it's almost like now you become a method actor where you've become the character and then they don't know how to draw the line between the person and the character and i think it starts leading them into like this it's honestly a very self-destructive path like the other day it was like last week or a couple of weeks ago i got like you know like when you have an iphone you get like those apple news alerts every now and then mm-hmm. So I saw one like Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, rock star dies at the age of 87. And I'm like this. And then I was like kind of impressed in a way because of the fact that there is a rocker who got to live until 87. Yeah. I cannot think of a single hip hop artist that is living to 87. And it kind of made me think like, why do we do that to ourselves? Like, why do we? put ourselves in harm's way why do we promote certain things or engage in certain things that are not conducive to people Mm -hmm. and it makes you wonder like you know we have to like a lot of things have to change within hip-hop yeah yeah a lot of things do have to change and like 
it's just unfortunate because you, you we get to this point where like it's pop smoke. It's like okay, we have to change, we have to change. Then there's P and B rock. Okay, we have to change, we have to change. Then it's take off. Okay, we have to change, we have to change. Like it's a never ending cycle. And like all we could do is hope and pray for it to change. Uh, but I I just I just don't know how it, we could get there, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it has to be a top-down effort. Like, the artists have to say enough is enough. We're not putting out this kind of content anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't care how well it does on the charts. We don't care how much it streams, right? We don't care how much money we make, how much fame, publicity we get. We're not making this kind of music anymore. Yeah. Right? Fans... You know, people who enjoy the music, and they have to stop supporting this kind of stuff. Like, say, like, yeah. we're going to put our hard-earned money into content that promotes this kind of nonsense because yeah. other cultures don't tolerate it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I think YG, one time he had a song on one of his albums, and he had, like, a, uh, it was like a single lyric, but he talked about, like, slapping an Asian or something like that. It was a lot mm -hmm. of those lines. Mm -hmm. And then... Literally, the Asian community said, no, this is inappropriate. This promotes violence against our people. We don't support this. We don't condone this. And then I think they ended up taking out that lyric from the song. They removed mm -hmm. it from, like, airplay, rotation, and all that. So as a community, they stood up and said, enough is enough, right? Yeah. That one line was a line too far. Mm -hmm. So there has to be that similar level of, I think, accountability yeah. Now the audience within, you know, the black community has to say enough is enough. Well, it's funny that you bring up the fans. And I think the fans uh, hold a lot of weight in the culture. And it's ironic because, like, I know we're going to talk about Drake's album later on. But for Drake to put out an album like Honestly Nevermind, of his previous album and then the fans a lot of the fans be upset uh, on social media because they want that rapper drake they want drake talking his shit they want drake um just being in that like bad energy type drake right as soon as he's in like a you know dance happier like love sad type of realm it's like, oh, no, this Drake, this is not it. This ain't it, blah, 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 blah. But, like, why does he have to be constrained to now focusing on rapping and talking about this artist or that artist or this and that person, this and that person, talking about this woman or that woman? Like, the fans are the reason why an artist has to shift or continue to talk about what they talk about because this is what they love like they always talk about they want the old drake they want the old this they want the the old they want the titles to be like the old young Jesus, the old whatever it may be right it's, it's the fans control a lot of that way right and, and it's i think fans have to change their mindset to just be more open to the art in itself and not so much the content right but the content is the content and people feed into content so much that it creates these narratives and these narratives create beefs and these narratives create arguments and you don't know who's going to be in what place and who said what to who right and then this is what leads to what the hip-hop community is today right solely based off the fans and them controlling and shifting narratives with their power of social media yeah, and it's it's a very it's a very strange dynamic because the fans' interests come from the main what the mainstream media pushes to them, right? So the stuff you're talking about, like you know, this is the kind of music that the people like because that's what the mainstream media backs, right? So then they're backing this, and then now the fans are responding to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And because of the fans are responding to it, they're going to push more of it. So it's yeah. kind of like this strange economic tug of war 
right? Who makes, who does a change have to start with? And that's, Mm -hmm. it's a very, it's very complex. And obviously, you know, we're not going to solve it within this one podcast, Mm -hmm. but that's what I kind of find to be that weird dynamic that happens. And that's why I think it's just a vicious cycle that continues. And I remember reading this one study that said, you know, hip hop has of any musical genre, it has the lowest life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Right. And unfortunately i do believe a lot of the content that gets produced it does mm-hmm. in fact you know does in fact correlate so yeah. Back, yeah it does correlate right yeah and it's it, it's very sad you know rest in peace to the to the young brother like he was only 20. Yeah. you know it's very sad yeah 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 indeed uh it's it is what it is unfortunately um my condolence to their, their friends and families. Um, and hopefully they'll be able to get over this and and prayers to Quavo, prayers to Offset, prayers to everyone within the hip hop community. Um, hopefully there'll be some change in the near future. Hopefully we don't have to go through losing a prolific artist in hip hop anytime soon again. Um, but uh, we definitely we definitely need a break from from all this morning that we 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 have to do with in this community. Yeah, definitely. I I like everything you just said there. And yeah. uh, last week when I had you on, I'm just gonna kind of shift gears a little bit. Yeah. But last week when I had you on, we were discussing, you know, the Brooklyn Nets, right? Yeah. And, um, we were kind of giving our predictions and thoughts of when we would do a a head coach change. Mm-hmm. And. Then, that literally happened right yeah before you know it yeah so it's almost like we didn't have a crystal ball when we we're doing that episode we just yeah we're just two brothers that know what we're looking at and we can yeah. see things for what they are yeah we, we we didn't we didn't push the button we didn't tell we didn't call sean marks and say hey man you want to turn this around here's what we need to do but uh yeah yeah steve nash had to suffer you know the ultimate consequence yeah, but he, although I would say it happened quicker than we thought it would happen, yeah. I think you said it would happen within the first 10 games, so you're pretty spot on. Mm-hmm. I said mm-hmm. I thought they would give him at least 15 games. Um, But then, yeah, you know, it had to be done. He, mm-hmm. he lost the locker room. Those guys didn't respect him. He himself had no idea what he was doing. He wasn't running plays. He wasn't running sets. It was just your turn, my turn basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, and then now they're saying well it was reported at that time and we both said that Ime Udoka would be a good selection for head coach and he's number one on their list yeah what do you make what do you make of him becoming the potential more than likely head coach of that team I feel like it's a very interesting move by the Nets organization um I think the Celtics series with the Nets last playoffs, I guess what they saw that he was doing for the Celtics, the adjustment he made and everything proved that he could be a good fit and that he is a good coach. So I think they're solely focusing on his ability to take a talented team and get the best out of players that are talented and take them to the final. So they're seeing that and they're like, if there's an opportunity to get that guy and take him away from a team that is within our our division and a team that's going to be our, a challenger that we have to face in the playoffs, it's kind of a win-win in their in their situation, right? Uh, but of course, there's there's other things to look at, right? There's a very sensitive matter that that happened with that coach, right? Um, and, it, and it's ironic, right? Like for them to be one to take on a a coach that has matters that are deemed negative in society uh, and then take that on. And then I know we're going to speak on a bit too and then go back and suspend one of your players for, again, something that's deemed not right in society it's 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 quite ironic because it's like when it benefits you it's okay but when it benefits someone else 
not okay. Uh, so it, again, it's an interesting signing in that sense because it's like we're taking on someone that is deemed to have done something wrong, hence why he's suspended for the year. But another player on your team that is doing something wrong in society as well um, or getting promoted as such that he's doing something wrong in society, you're not so much in support of, of him, right? So I, I, I see it as an interesting in that standpoint. But again, they're just looking at the mere fact that he was able to take a talented Celtics team to the finals. He made the adjustments to beat a Brooklyn team um, with a talented Brooklyn team. And now what is his ability going to be having someone like Kevin Durant and, and Joe Harris, Seth Curry, um, Kyrie Irving, we'll see, um, and other players on that team, right? So it'll be interesting. Um, I know it's not finalized yet, um, but we'll see if it gets finalized because there is a lot of things going on right now that they're dealing with with the book and that's what I so I don't see how it gets finalized anytime soon maybe it does I was kind of confused about the suspension like I guess it was a team suspension a Boston Celtics suspension and not so much an NBA suspension that was handed down to um, Ime Doka so again I guess whenever he sees available to um, sign officially I guess he gets that coding right yeah and it seems that the Celtics are willing to part ways with him. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, now that you mentioned that, I do find it – I do find it to be a little bit strange in this regards, right? So the Nets are complaining that a very specific player is not readily available to the team so they don't feel comfortable giving him a contract extension because mm-hmm. of his lack of availability, right? But then – you know, a situation happened in regards to said player, and then they were now suspended for five games, right? So it's like the team is hindering the per- the player's availability, right? And then you say that, you know, you don't want to bring distractions to the locker room. You just want it to be about the game. But then now you're hiring a coach who in the offseason was the biggest story. Like throughout training camp, this was the biggest story. Yeah. So, you have that and going on your locker room. And on top of that, you traded for a player who for an entire season was one of the biggest stories um, for not being available. Right. So it's kind of like, what, like, what is really like, what are you really doing here? Because you traded for a player whose biggest concern was lack of availability Mm -hmm. for two seasons in a row. You told another player to stay away from the team for two different incidences. Right. Right. And then now you're bringing in a coach that was suspended for off the court, an off a court situation, an off court situation. Yeah. It was consensual, by the way, no laws were broken. Yeah. And so you're, you are creating this locker room of distractions and lack of availability. Mm-hmm. But then you say you want it to be about the game. So mm-hmm. what is this really? Like, what is really going on in that locker room, right? Yeah. So that, to me, is a leadership issue. That is an mm-hmm. organizational issue. But it's always top down. Yeah. So the dysfunction is, is being created by management. It's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I mean, you, you take on Durant. He's one thing. And Durant is going to create a direction being a top five player and being a unique individual in his way he goes about operating his life and then you have Kyrie you have another distraction so you can tell that there is no direction from leadership they're just doing things just to do things because it seems like the right thing to do but it's not leading to success clearly right so like you said it comes down to leadership and you can see why Kevin Durant asked for a trade right in the offseason right you can see now he's like, oh, wow, I really messed up. I really didn't put myself in a situation that's going to lead to success. And he, he's really seeing it 
first and foremost, right? And I don't know how he gets out of this situation, really and truly, because they're not going to trade him. He's under contract. And I don't see this Brooklyn Nets team with all this distraction focusing on basketball and turning it around and making him a successful season. <clears throat> to be honest, I don't really knock Kitty so much for this choice. Mm-hmm. Like, for a couple of reasons. I'll, I'll explain why. So, although he was winning and experiencing success in Golden State, mm-hmm. it was it was clear that he just wasn't happy there. You know what I mean? Like, is, and it, like I know happy is a very fleeting thing, mm-hmm. but it's like, imagine working in an environment where, yeah, you're making really good money. It's in a field that you're experienced in, but the environment around you is just not, like the environment around you is just not delivering what you want for one reason or another, right? Mm-hmm. Then I could see him saying, okay, you know, I, I, I want to leave and I kind of want to just go off and do my own thing, right? I think mm-hmm. with him coming to Brooklyn, it was just about, I just want to play with my boy. Like, this guy's one of the best friends that I have in the league. I just want to be able to hoop with him, right? Mm. And then just everything just kind of outside of his control just really, like, really went wrong. Like, if you think about it, like, that first year in Brooklyn, he didn't even play because he was recovering from that injury, right? Mm. And Kyrie was actually available shouldering the load on that team, right? And then the season after, they trade for Harden, right? Or... And it's kind of a blur, but there was that – what season was it or what playoff series was it where they were in the second round and then Giannis stepped on Kyrie's foot? Was that the 2021 playoffs? It was Giannis stepped on Kyrie's foot, and then Kyrie yeah. was out. Kyrie and injured. Yeah, and, and that then was that, that was – I think that was their first year altogether, right? Yeah, so that – okay, so that was just – okay, so that was his second year – in his tenure in Brooklyn, him, but their first yeah. season together was him, Kyrie, and Harden. Yeah, but I think Harden was injured that series. Of injured with the hamstring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so. then Kyrie, Kyrie got hurt and he was out. And then Harden tried to come back, and then he couldn't because of the hamstring was just too much. And then they ended up being Ky- KD by himself. And here we are again. Yeah. KD by himself. So it's like there's just a lot of things that were happening outside of his control that just didn't make his tenure be as successful as possible, right? So would he have had more basketball success staying in Golden State? Yes, I do believe that he would have, right? Mm -hmm. But for one reason or another, and maybe one day there'll be a documentary about this, he just wasn't happy or comfortable in that environment, Mm -hmm. right? You look at the stuff that's going on with Draymond Green and Jordan Poole, maybe that's just not the kind of culture that he wanted to be in, right? Mm -hmm. Where he thought there wasn't enough accountability, I don't know. But for whatever reason, it wasn't conducive for him. He wanted out. That's his prerogative, right? Whether or not he will regret it, he probably will. But I don't think he should be hard on himself because there's so much stuff happening outside of his control. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like year after year, if it's not one thing, it's the next. And you would think that you'd come into this season and a, a huge question mark was Kyrie Irving, right? and his availability and will he be able to play a full season without any distractions and hey i thought we were going to the season well yes he might do some Kyrie things but will it elevate to a point where he's getting suspended and get to the point where we find ourselves today um where he's now getting suspended for a few games and now he's losing endorsement deals and now it's the cameras and all the attention and the distraction of Kyrie Irving is just the distraction of Kyrie Irving. So he finds himself in a similar place where does Kyrie just take his five game suspension and then, or yeah, I think it's five game suspension and then come back and just be so quiet or will something else happen or will, Brooklyn just be like, we can't deal with this guy. Let's try to trade him to the Lakers. Like, I don't, I don't know where we go from here with the Brooklyn Nets. Like, so I guess we could discuss Kyrie's future after all this thing, all the things have that has transpired with this whole uh, anti-Semitism 
um, that we're discussing with the media right now um, with Kyrie around Kyrie Irving. Where do you see the future of the Brooklyn Nets and Kyrie? Are we saying he gets traded? Uh, are we saying he stays on the team? Or are we saying he's away from basketball? Hmm. I mean, I think he will finish out the season mm-hmm. in a Brooklyn uniform. Yeah. Um, I just don't see the trade market. I just don't see the trade market being. Open. I don't see there being a big, yeah, a very open or yeah. big trade market for him at this time, right? Now, so you think his value is just as as bad as like. Oh, oh, Russell Westbrook for yeah, him off the court. Yeah, because if you look, I believe that he paid a five hundred thousand dollar fine as well as the organization. Right mm-hmm. now, the organization will probably look at it like, "Why am I paying five hundred thousand dollars for something just because we employ this guy?" Right. Mm-hmm. So they're probably so a lot of teams might look at it and say, "You know, that's just not something that we need right now." Mm-hmm. So I don't see it being a very open trade market for him. So I think he finishes out the season in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But I think the media, like with everything that's going on in that locker room, and this was even before all this like recent stuff started happening, I already thought the the media focus was too much within that locker room. But now you Mm -hmm. add this situation, you throw in the coach that they're going to potentially hire, it's going to lead to a lot of, it's going to lead to a media circus, right? Mm-hmm. So I think he finishes out the season. Now, in terms of his long-term playing career, I really don't know. Like, mm-hmm. it can go one of two ways. Like, he would either have, like, a like a redemption, right? Like, it's a redemption moment where he can, like, you know, overcome all the, like, negative press that he's been getting. But I could also see it going the Craig Hodges way. Right, mm. or the Mahmoud Abdul Rauf way, yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't want that for him. You know, I want him to have a long career, I want to see him, you know, be successful and become the best, become the best player that he could possibly be, right? While also having peace within his own personal life. But with everything that's going on, I just don't see how that's happening. Like, and then the fact that Shannon Sharp is coming out saying that you're going to end up like Craig Hodges, that to me is com- kind of like you're signaling the alarm that that's where that might be what yeah. the temperature of the room is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because because you you gotta look at Shannon Sharp and know that he's very involved, uh, has a a um, understanding of where the situations that are occurring and where it could end up right so and it's almost like speaking it into existence right putting that in the in the atmosphere um so again it's going to be something that we will have to continue to watch and see what will happen um but do you think this will affect brooklyn enough to make them a playoff team or not make them a playoff team do you think this puts them at, affects them enough to hinder their season enough? Or do you think KD and his talents will be enough to carry them to a playoff spot and to keep them relevant enough to keep up with everyone else? I mean, I think they have enough to get to a playoff, to get to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they're having a slow start right now. I think they're, what, three and six? Yeah. Um, at the time of this recording, but Golden State is also three and seven. Do I believe mm-hmm. that Golden State will continue to be a 12 C team in the West? No, you know, I don't. no, right? So, I do think that Brooklyn, you know, all you need is just to kind of have one run, mm-hmm. or you could win some games and then you're right back in, you're right back in the hunt, right? So, I think ultimately, yeah, Brooklyn can get to the playoffs, but. The thing is with the season and to a larger degree, the playoffs is it's about the mentality of what the team is, right? Mm -hmm. So if this team is constantly battling the media and the media attention, that can really take its toll and drain you, right? 
So with all of that mental strain it puts on them, will they have enough to overcome and win a championship? Just the pressure alone of winning a championship is enough. Now you add in this, it's gonna be it's gonna be really tough. So right now I don't see them winning a championship, but making the playoffs I see happening. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, we'll see. There's a lot of distractions. Uh, I think they will be a playoff team as well. Um, but we'll see. I think Ben Simmons has to get it much better. And I, I saw a report that Kevin Durant is frustrated at the situation with Ben Simmons because he is off to a very slow start. Um, but it doesn't seem like there is any. any like any like um signs of him improving or getting better or getting back to that old Ben. So that will be very alarming for them. Um but I do want to see them as a fully healthy team in the future. But with the new coach as well. But there's a lot a lot to tell from now yeah. until very early. Um, but we'll eventually find out. And I want to preface it, right? Because, like, I know there's a lot going on. Uh, we don't have to get, we're not going to be getting into all the stuff that's yeah. going on, all the commentary. You know, we don't get caught up in the opinions. You and I were, were chroniclers. Mm-hmm. We just discuss what's going on in the time that we're in, right? But, you know, I. I I understand the power that media has. We kind of talked about it last time with new media, old media, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, when I heard, like, the Craig Hodges comparison, or when I hear Shaq and Barkley call him an idiot, it's like you're doing too much at that point, right? And it's, you know, if you don't agree with what someone does, you have every right to not agree. Right. If you say I don't like the content he's putting out, I think he's using social media irresponsibly. That's beneath him to do all that. I have zero problems with anyone holding that opinion. Right. It's just when you start calling someone names, like calling them an idiot, that's where it's it rubs me the wrong way. Right. Because mm-hmm. it's, like, it, it's becoming personal. And like as someone in the media who is meant to be an expert analysis reporting on the game. It's not, the game is not being discussed anymore, right? So I, you don't have to agree with someone's conduct and I understand that, right? People should be held accountable for their conduct, right? But when you call someone an idiot, like that to me kind of crosses, it goes goes outside of the scope of media. So that's the part that rubs me the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, again, it's no longer the coverage of the sport; it's more so the coverage of people. And yeah, and that's the that kind of goes back to what we said last time with the whole new media paradigm, right? And you know, while we're on the topic of media and Brooklyn Nets, I think there's another layer to the conversation that we can kind of get into is when they announced that they wanted to hire this coach, uh, Ime Udoka. Mm-hmm. Um. Malika Andrews, for reasons that I'm going to explain in a moment, was very frustrated by this hiring. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, yes, the guy, you know, he was in a consensual relationship, right? It more than likely was probably handled inappropriately, right? But at the end of the day, it was consensual. It happened, right? It was between him, the lady that it was with, his fiance at the time, and that's it. It didn't need to be made public. It didn't need to become the story that it became. And then for her to be reacting the way that she is and for her to be talking the way that she is, tell me that there's something deeper going on than you just not, than basketball. It's like you have a personal issue with this man getting a job. Like, I don't, and I don't understand why you have so much animosity and animus towards this guy. Yeah. Uh, again, um, 
we're, we're at a time where black women are trying to support or women in general. I don't know. Don't need need to say black women. Women are just supporting each other at the end of the day, regardless of the facts of the matter. Um, if it's something that degrades women in any shape or form, they're going to be in support of the woman and they're going to be anti-men. Um, no matter what, like the facts or whatever, or even if it doesn't have to deal with her as an individual, they're going to stand on the ledge for that woman and scrutinize that man at the end of the day just to be in support of uplifting women, right, at the end of the day. And, and it's it's hard because it shouldn't be as much as you should uplift women, you should also uplift a Black man, right, in society, right? It's not easy for him as an individual. It's not easy for what he's going through. And yes, he might have done something wrong in society sense, but or how it shifted in the in media, or the narrative of where it stands. Um, oh, no one knows the finer details of what actually happened, right? So, at the end of the day, like you shouldn't have to move the goalposts when, yes, you're uplifting or you're supporting women and their traumas and what they go through, but what about that black man and his traumas and what he has to go through and what he what hurdles he had to go through and get over um and it, it's boston right boston's not a very like multicultural city right um so in that sense who knows what he has to do with on a day-to-day basis who knows how he was approached um within the situation those fire details aren't really revealed so it's hard for Malika Andrews to just plant her flag on one side with not knowing the full details of the other side and that's the thing and I think you really made a key point because at the end of the day like hatred towards men particularly black men has become very normalized right Mm -hmm. like And with her, it's very obvious to me that she has something against black men. Like she does not like black men. Right. And yeah, it it just like, it oozes out of her pores. (laughs) Like it's very obvious. Like you hate this man and you hate black men, period. Right. Mm -hmm. Now it comes down to the why. Right. And there is a double standard when it comes to that aspect. Right. Because, you know, people can be with whoever they want to be with. But she's with Dave McMenamin, who is a white rep- white, white journalist that works at ESPN. Mm-hmm. No one cares. No one's calling her a sellout. No one's saying like she hates, you know, she hates black. Well, I'm saying that she hates black men, but that's <laughs> not the narrative. That's not the narrative that surrounds her, right? Yeah. But then when it's a black athlete or someone who's black who ha- who has a white wife or a wife that's of another different race that's not black, then it's like, oh, he hates black women. He's a sellout. He's this. And it's that double standard, right? And I think the thing is, yeah, usually women, they usually tend to stick together. But this is not even, even this, this particular situation, there's nothing to stick together to. It was both grown adults that were in committed relationships that made a decision to get to get together. Yeah. Right. For me, my only disappointment with with the with uh Yudoka is just the fact that of his age, that you should be old enough to know better. Yeah. This is something that like someone in their 20s, maybe their 30s, they would do, but you are like an elder statesman in the league. You're mm-hmm. a head coach. So they look to you as an authority figure. You should know better than to get caught up in this kind of stuff right but that's just me holding him to a high standard as a man aside from yeah. that there's really not much else wrong that i could think of exactly and exactly. the way the way people in the media right like particularly matt barnes the way he's coming out and telling this story you're making it sound oh it's 100 times worse than we thought it was so then why do the nets want to give him a job a few months later 
Exactly. Exactly. I feel like media is taking stories and they are like overly, almost saying things to make themselves like sound like the best person possible, defending the person that not at all trying to defend the the victim as much as possible, right? And they want to stand and plant their flag or be the first one to plant their flag with the victim and be in support of the victim. <laughs> Even so much to say things that are so outlandish without knowing every detail, but just to be like, oh, wow, look at what she said. Or, oh, wow, look at like what he said, right? Not knowing that, is that really how you feel? Or are you just saying that because it's going to give you <clears throat> it's going to get you that click page. It's going to get you that attention. It's going to give you a headline that people are going to click on. It's going to go on too cool to blog and they're going to look at it and be like, oh, it's going to be on complex. Oh, look what she said, right? I feel like people are really looking for viral moments and we're in a, we're in a, in a point in time where like anything that people say, it's just like, it's getting so much more attention. Everyone is, is almost discussing a discussion, right? Everyone is like, oh, she said this, let's discuss it. He said that, let's discuss it, right? This happened, let's discuss it. From that conversation, let's discuss what they said. Like, it, it's, everything's over-scrutinized and it's no one's, like, we don't know what authentic is anymore. Nothing seems authentic. Everyone seems like they're just doing things because it's going to be, like, be seen as, oh, the right thing to do. And I think, yeah, like what you're allu alluding to is, um, is like, I like it's a term like uh, virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. There is a whole lot of that that goes on in this society now. Like, oh, look at me. I'm a good person. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to talk down on someone and say that person's a bad person. But then, you know, Kwame Brown, like he he says something like he's very accurate and now he reports on things mm -hmm. because it's all about as a society who we like right and that's yeah. what he says and it's very true like when we like someone we look the other way at the stuff that they do right like yeah. two people can do the exact same thing or they can say the exact same thing but if we like the person if we like one of the people that said it we're not going to get triggered by that or get offended but yeah. then when it's someone that society doesn't like as a whole now suddenly that person's wrong for saying it yeah and you know it is what happens like you know back to what you're saying about viral how much times do you see on like ig or twitter a girl will go viral for saying yo many like many shit yeah, yeah. garbage oh i'm yeah. going to show you women how to finesse men out of their money and finesse multiple mm -hmm. guys and it's cool like girls say yes queen do what you got to do queen right but then let a guy say, Yo, I'll show you guys mm -hmm. how to ask girls. Well, yeah. that's misogynistic. You're manipulating women. You're trying to yeah. control women. And it's like, so what is, like, where, where, where is the moral line <laughs> where right mm -hmm. is right and wrong is wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really know, right? And it's, it's all we can do is look to people like, like Drake that could uh, just discuss the losses of, of women, right? When they want to go about um, saying that we ain't shit and all that. It's, uh, at the end of the day, it, it's just her loss. <laughs> and I think that's the perfect segue. You know, that album dropped, you know, what yes. you came out. Well, uh, what were your coming, thoughts off, coming, coming off of our last episode, like we discussed, there's not a lot of like marketing around it. Like you haven't seen a lot of build up around it. Like he's, you're surprised that like it's just coming out with no, you know, build up, no marketing, no promotion. But then it's funny again, Crystal Ball. Monday or Tuesday, we're seeing um, he does the whole the Vogue all parody, right? But he does the Vogue parody. Like there was like a Vogue um shoot that they had with 21 savage and drake they had the whole um parody of the tiny desk because you know how everyone every artist is going to tiny desk and they're having their little concert home concert right and then finally he did the um the uh was it 
Howard Stern. I forget his name. Howard Stern, right? Howard Stern interview, right? Like all the cliche things that that artist do to to roll up the albums, and he made a parody of it. Uh, and that was that was a marketing roller. And I, I think it was it was amazing the way he went about it, right? Because you're like, oh wow, you 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 get the excitement, like, oh my god, a, a, a tiny desk is coming out, or to those people that Vogue and him always reference Vogue, because like, oh wow, a Vogue magazine that I could uh, purchase, or oh wow, this podcast that I can listen to now, right? Like, so he hit every trending stream, right? The Tiny Desk, the Howard Stern uh, interview, the Vogue magazine. Like, these are all trending things that everyone is looking to look at or um, looking for the next volume of, right? Or the next episode, right? Or, or the next post. So I thought that was an amazing rollout. So he did end up coming out with marketing around the album, even though it was short-lived. It, it, it did what it had to do. And then he had his Table for, table for One uh, radio show, episode two, where he played some songs, played some mixes, and then he got into the album. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on the album before I give my thoughts on the album. To be honest, I thought the album, like, I enjoyed it. Like, I thought yeah. he was kind of, it was like certified lover boy Drake, but a yeah. more, but a polished. more polished and a more hungrier, a more energetic, a more enthused. So I thought he had like that certified lover boy thing going, but with the enthusiasm of like, a honestly, never mind, where he kind yeah. of actually sounded like this is the he kind enjoyed of thing it. I'm going to yeah. make. And I think the reason why he was able to kind of tap into that thing is because 21 Savage was there, yeah. right? Because at the end of the day, I think he genuinely enjoys collaborating with him. And I think they have a friendship outside yeah. of music. So I think that allowed for the quality. I think that came out in the actual quality of the music. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoyed the album. Um, yeah. I thought he, like, I don't know necessarily if there was like any, notable bars where i was like where it was jaw dropping but he said some things yeah. that obviously made headlines and yeah i got the feminist going yeah for sure <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> but um no he definitely like he, he came out hard on this one you know he definitely delivered on this project yeah um, yeah so yeah let me know what your thoughts were yeah uh i i agree i i think like um his performance on this album was was amazing and it seemed like he was enjoying what he was doing and enthusiastic and he and it, it was like he was inspired right a lot of his previous projects it seemed like he was lacking a bit of inspiration or lacking a bit of just like or, or almost felt like he was just going through the motion like let me get this project out whatever the case may be but i feel like him getting the opportunity to put out honestly never mind um, but he's just having fun and doing music that he wants to do was almost like a relief for him. It's like, okay, whatever they say, like if they love it, they hate it. This is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to put out me as an artist. So now I've done that. Let me get back to the bullshit, right? So now he's back on the bullshit and he was with it and he approached it in the sense of, like, let me bring on 21. Let me bring in a, uh, a guy that's going to inspire me, that's going to put me in a mindset to be competitive to say to get shit off my chest and not so much hold back or be cautious of what I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna say it have fun here with my friend in the studio making music. Let's bring in little Yachty to do some ad libs and stuff like that. Um I think it was it was well put together. You bring in Travis Scott as well. He always loves to have that little Yachty, Travis Scott, 21 Savage, 40 of course, if he put together a team to put together this project and he didn't add in like his usual having like little baby, little dirt, future, putting so much people to make it so like convoluted. Like he actually like focused it in in his sound, the attention to details, the production, the sample. Um, I think it was just well done. It, it was one of his better projects in a while, for example, that's like a short con condensed but like efficient project right um so i, I think this one's gonna age well and it's like 
I, I don't know. You got to appreciate him, man. He's able to tap into, honestly, never mind, right? And something so off-putting and the hate that came from that just inspired him to be like, don't forget, I'm still singing, rapping Drake. I can still do this, right? And that's what he displayed. Yeah, and I think when we did the episode about honestly, never mind. Yeah. I think I'll, like we both brought up the fact that he's like a global artist and he wanted to make like global music. And I think, mm -hmm. I can't remember what track it was because it's still fresh, but I remember he had a line where he was kind of like basically addressing that. Like, yeah. I had to make that kind of music, right? For my for my private plane rides. Yeah. So he's basically saying right then and there that, yeah, I had to make music <laughs> for my global audience, right? And one thing that he does really well is like he says bars that can create a conversation outside mm -hmm. of the music. Yeah. So for example, when he was talking about, um, you know, guys who got no girls in high school are, are making laws. Yeah. A lot of people kind of thought he was talking about like the Andrew Tates of the world. And, mm -hmm. But to me, when he says making laws, I'm thinking he's talking about like the lawmakers that are yeah. passing bills, right? Yeah, yeah. But it makes for good conversation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and he had that line about, you know, lying about getting shot. And everyone yeah. immediately thought it's about Megan Thee Stallion. Yeah. Then... Before we started this video, you brought up a good point about girls getting shots, like, you know, BBLs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lip injections and all that. Like, he, he hits you with things that, are like, there's a triple entendre to it. You can see it how you want to see it. You can, And I guess Twitter, that's what Twitter do. That's what social media do. That's not him. He's just making a, a reference that could be double entendres. And then you run with it. You got to discuss it. You can discuss it. You can... You could um, run it back how many times the line is, the lyric is the lyric, however you want to hear it, right? However you want to take it in, however you want to spin it, that's on you. I said what I said, and he doesn't, like, you know, like you said, he does a great job of being a person to give the journal something to like, wait, what does he mean by that? Like a lot of like clickbait type quotes are like, is he talking about this? Is he talking about that? Is he talking about Ice Spice? What do you mean? He did that with like, yeah, she's a ten, um, but she can't rap. She's better when it, it's better when it's on mute, right? Like that could be a lot. Like there's a lot of women that are ten that that can't rap, <laughs> right? So like, who who knows? Like the media is gonna take it how they take it. But he does a great job of creating conversations through his lyric because he's just very tapped in to everything that's going on. He knows who's hot. He knows who's not. He knows so much of what's going on. He knows so much of the co topics of conversation and he just throws it in there, right? And then he takes it for you to create those narratives and say what you want. And then he'll just disappear and focus on living his life, right? Yeah, it was very, yeah, it's, it was brilliantly done. Um, yeah. so it was definitely welcoming and I was definitely glad that he uh, put that album out and I'm glad that he was able to deliver on it. Um, yeah, so I think I had doubts about whether or not their ability to make good songs can translate into a full album. Mm -hmm. So they definitely have shown that they could put together a decent album. I think they complement each other very well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and it looks like they'll be going on a tour, a Drake and 21 Savage tour. That will be quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure if 21 Savage is able to make it to. Uh, Toronto, but I know they discussed him going to London on the radio show. Uh, so hopefully they'll get a chance to come to Toronto, or hopefully people will get a chance to see him somewhere. But I think that would be an amazing tour, Drake and 21 Savage uh, tour. And I think 21 Savage also has more music to come out. Like 20 Savage hasn't really dropped a project in a while. So as much as he had this collaboration project where he wasn't really that um, he didn't really have a lot of content on the album. Um, so I'm sure he's going to have to put out more content for, for a tour. Yeah, he probably will. And I didn't know he, he's touring with Drake. Can, Canada will. You can't lose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Canada will yeah. come through, I think, because 
It's Drake. Yeah, Drake Drake's very generous, right? He takes these guys that are, yeah, like they can hold their own, but you know, like you're lucky to be that person that's attached attached to Drake because like now that uplifts you tenfold, right? That now, now you're globally known. Yeah. And you know, there's actually one bar he said that kind of made me laugh because it was actually true. He's like, you know, I can like I can go on your track and make record labels think that you're a big deal and they need you. Yeah, they I'm need like, you. <laughs> I'm like, that's actually true when you think about it, because how much artists got opportunities and deals that they had no business getting just because they had that Drake cosign. Yeah. Like, so it's it's crazy. Like, that's usually the thing. Like, the best jokes, the best bars are the ones that are rooted in truth. So I think that's yeah. great. Okay. Like, this he guy, does, he does a good job of that. Yeah, yeah, he does a great job of that. So, yeah, well, uh, well, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's only been a, a day yeah. <laughs> with the album, um, but it's, it's one of one of his better projects for sure. Yeah, much agreed. But, yeah. Jordan, this was a great conversation. I think, you know, we had a long week. So it was kind yeah. of good for us to just kind of, you know, come here, chop it up, and just kind of clear up our – clear up these thoughts that were lingering in our head, bro, because a lot happened. 100%, yeah. Now it feels like it's kind of been released, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's good to it's good to have a chance to just talk about it and get it off your chest rather than just, like, all have it fester inside and you can't really just, like, share your thoughts or you're cautious of how you want to go about sharing your thoughts, but it's good to be able to just talk about it and talk it out, right? Definitely, because, like, even, too, sometimes, like, you might think something and then it's, like, a there might not be anyone there that you can share it with or b mm -hmm. you don't know how they're going to take it if take it yeah it. yeah so i think a lot of times especially us as men like we kind of just say you know what i'm just gonna keep this to myself you know what I mean? right. <laughs> so, right. good to kind of have like friendships and like that you can just kind of like just talk it out if yeah. you have a platform like this you know it always kind of it's it's a bonus but just having yeah. people that you can talk to is important bro like it's yeah exactly man yeah for real yeah thank you for your time it's always great having you on and we'll yeah. look forward to having you on for future episodes as well bro it's... yeah of course man appreciate it as always as always and, and you're on instagram as well so people can find you on there if you want to plug your instagram quick right okay again it's jordan underscore lynch 11 find me on all socials okay perfect until next time bro take care